Welcome everyone. I'm Heather Farrell, Curator and Director of Exhibitions, and we're just going to wait a few minutes while everyone joins us here for our BCA Center Virtual Artist Talk with Joanne Carson, also joining me right now. How are you today, Joanne? I'm very good. I'm Great. looking forward to this. I've been anticipating it, and it'll be fun to give a presentation in such a kind of online way, but I know we have an audience out there who we can't see, but I know they're there. I'm trying to imagine them and visualize everyone joining us <laughs> in a very large digital circle for today's talk. It's, it's great that people showed up like this in the middle of the day. I welcome everyone. Thank them for coming to this. Yeah. And, and how is uh, Shoram treating you? right now well i feel awfully lucky to be here because ordinarily at this point in the year i would be living in brooklyn and even though new york is much more under control obviously than it was in march it's almost i can spend days being in shoreham and taking walks in the country which i do every day i don't see another person i don't need to wear a mask and so i feel like the pandemic's at a great distance and it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful here. It's been a little colder than usual, but the leaves are starting to change color. And I yeah. love to see that. I love to live in a climate that has a seasonal change. So it's not like Brooklyn has a seasonal change, but you never know it. <laughs> because there aren't that many trees. There's less garbage on the street. That's how you know that you're entering fall. <laughs> And uh, you probably have to drive a little further if you want to go apple picking. Yes, you do. And right now I have two apple trees that are giving apples off. And I've made some, I don't know, it, like I'm a city dweller my whole life up until now. And so for me to have pear trees that I can make desserts from pears that I planted those trees, it, it's so hugely exciting to me. I love that. Likewise with the apples. Yes, there has been a reconnection with gardening and being in the natural world and benefiting from kind of creating your own delicacies from it. I know. Oh I've my God, yeah, it's life changing. It truly is. And I don't grow food. I just have a kind of rule about that because I don't want to have to fight the animals off, you know? So whatever the animals, the rabbits, the squirrels, the chipmunks, well, not the chipmunks, I uh, want to do because they dig up all the bulbs. It's really okay because I'm not. I can buy food at the store. That's how I figure it. I so like I it. guess just, it's a community garden <laughs> for animals. <laughs> Whoever else wants to come over, right? Well, I think we might give it just maybe one more minute because I know it takes people a few few minutes to all log on. We have a big group joining us today. Yeah. And I know you, you've been such a trooper because uh, you're fresh out of doing classes earlier this morning, teaching virtually, yes. correct? Exactly. I'm teaching, well, I've been teaching at the University at Albany for over 30 years, but I've never taught this class before, which is beginning drawing. And I've supervised the graduate teaching assistants who teach it for 30 years. But teaching it myself has been extremely enlivening. Just, I think it must be the way you feel if you see a child learning to speak. It makes you think about language. And watching my students learn how to hold a pencil and draw from the shoulder, I don't know how to explain it. It's just made me more aware of how I'm working in my own studio. It's, I, I, don't, I can't believe I'm saying this about online teaching, but it's kind of been fun. So. Oh. <laughs> That's good to hear. I think we need those moments of inspiration because sometimes uh, it can be challenging. Yeah. But, but we're going to have a wonderful program today, everyone. I am so delighted. I think we're going to go ahead and start, Joanne. Okay. And I'll just introduce myself again. I'm Heather Farrell. I'm the Curator and Director of Exhibitions at the BCA Center here in Burlington. And thank you for joining BCA for our virtual artist talk with Joanne Carson. We are very pleased to have Joanne join us today to discuss the work in her current exhibition, A Sense of Wonder, and its context within her overall artistic practice. Now, before we begin, I'd like to share just a few notes on today's program. Um, after my introductions, Joanne will give a presentation on the evolution of her work as she's moved between painting drawing and sculpture over the past few decades. 
And she's also gonna share some insights into her process and imagery. We would love to hear questions from our participants. As you know, I always love dialogue and time at the end for this. So please use the Zoom Q&A feature to pose your question, which Joanne will answer at the end of her presentation. And there's also a chat feature if you wanna share a comment. A reminder that today's webinar will be recorded and posted on our VCA Home Studio site. Now for a short introduction, um, dividing her time between Shoreham, Vermont and Brooklyn, New York, Joanne Carson is a nationally renowned artist whose drawings, paintings and sculptures work together to tell imaginative and mysterious narratives about nature and our world. BCA's exhibition, A Sense of Wonder, features large scale paintings and drawings created over the past decade and her improvisational worlds of flora embody playful, surreal, and often dark connotations. Richly patterned, pulsating with color, her imagery evokes nature's transformative and cyclical aspects, while recognizing the paradox of its creative and destructive power. Following her undergraduate degree from the University of Illinois, Joanne earned her MFA from the University of Chicago before launching her career. And since then, she has exhibited her work in numerous solo and group exhibitions, including venues such as the Brooklyn Museum of Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, the Frederick Wiseman Art Museum, and the Whitney Museum of American Art. She is also a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, the American Academy's Rome Prize, and the Louise Bourgeois Residency from Yaddo, among others. Currently, Joanne is Professor of Studio Art and Graduate Director of Art and Art History at the University of Albany, New York, where she, like so many of us, are teaching, learning, and exploring art through uh, an enhanced digital platform. Thank you for joining us today, Joanne, and I'd like to turn the time over to you. Thank you so much, Heather. That was a lovely introduction. Uh, and in this online time, it's such a treat to be having a show in person in a brick and mortar space. I want to thank Heather and the staff of BCA, particularly Colin Stores, for making this show really enjoyable for me in such a difficult time. The title of this show is A Sense of Wonder. It's the thematic lens through which I will speak about my work today. I wish that I could say I thought of that title in a moment of epiphany, but the truth is that it was Heather who thought of it. Uh, the title captures a force that drives my work. I'm not alone, of course. We all have a sense of wonder, affected by moments in our lives of being awed or overwhelmed by something that just seems vividly alive and beautiful. So this image presentation today highlights moments that I was gobsmacked by some idea or inspiration and how it found its way into my work. So I'll just take a moment here to screen share and to get the image up on the screen. Let's see, slideshow. Okay. I'm going to start by talking about um, early influences because I think that I'm myself always agog at how something happened early in my life that I was unaware of how powerful it was because what do you know when you're seven years old. So I'm starting with this painting. It's a Mark Rothko painting from 1940. It's called Crucifixion and it was hanging in our den when I was growing up. That's kind of unlikely because Mark Rothko is one of the most famous painters, American painters of the 20th century. So it's an odd fact given that we lived in a suburban Baltimore and we're not wealthy. But my mother was married to Rothko in the 1930s and she had this painting. So even when I was very, very young, I could recognize that it wasn't like anything else in my whole environment. My mother, she was an artist. And she was, she believed that you should make things, none of which two would be the same. So it was a kind of madcap environment of living in a group show that my mother had produced by herself. And no two paintings were alike. But this painting by Rothko, its weirdness, its serenity, its grotesquery, it stayed with me. 
And another early influence was Bob's Big Boy. After all, I was seven years old. I didn't have highbrow taste. Um, but I still get a kick out of it. I don't think that Bob's Big Boy is in business anymore. I'm not so sure about that. But it was an early influence because it seemed to communicate something about a monster, a quality of animation of a character. Was he a boy? Was he a man? Was he a monster? Was he a cartoon? Impossible to tell. But I love and I continue to love the nature of the improbable as something that we can uh, embrace and work within. So all my work for the next 60 years <laughs> was somewhere between Rothko and Bob's Big Boy. I think that this painting may illustrate this. It's a painting that's called Palatable from 1980. And like most young artists, I had an Oedipal complex to the work of the past that I loved. Cubism was it for me. I, I, I wanted to kick a hole in the tradition to make room for myself. That was my goal. I wanted to see something that is old become new again and feel that it had something to do with my own ambition. And so this piece, which is an assemblage, it's sculpture that is painted and elements of sculpture that you can see. It's a kind of lampooning of cubism, but it's also what I would say a kind of homage, a, a love at the same time that it wasn't like a mockery. It was like trying to make something new. This is how it looks from the side. And you, a lot of the elements are the same that the cubists would use, playing cards, palettes, brushes, etc. I made these assemblages for many years, for probably about 12, maybe more than 12 years. And very quickly, I began to realize some of the rules of the game. This painting is about uh, seven by seven feet. It was painted in 1981. It's called Open Window. And one of the things I realized right away is if you were going to start sticking things like a full scale chair in a painting, that painting's got to be big. Otherwise, the chair starts to feel like it's dominating the space. So this is celebrating something that I see in hindsight is that how unlikely can you make a painting be? It has a full size chair, yet it resolves into a single image when you're standing straight ahead of it. However, when you move off center, that image is disrupted and the uh, sculptural, in this case, furniture elements start to assert themselves. So it's a curious kind of relationship for a viewer because it's both settling and then literally disrupted and unsettling. This is, uh, I'm going quickly through the early work because I want to focus on the pieces that are in the BCA show. So this is from 1983. It's called Curtain Call. It's a kind of homage to a theatrical reinterpretation of a Picasso painting called The Balcony from 1921. The magic of theatrical representation fascinates me. And I, the fact that it's believable while not at all being accurate or naturalistic so for example, the waves in this painting, which are on the other side of the guitar, waves don't look like that. That's a symbolic representation of a wave. And then the whole painting sort of exists as if there's a patterning that the wrought iron balcony might make into a space. This is what it looks like from the side. You can see that there's an actual guitar that I've carved up. There's uh, shutters and of course plastic fruit. This is a installation shot. I had many shows of this work. This was at the Ruth Siegel Gallery on 57th Street in New York City. Uh, I think probably 1986 or so. She had this very famous white floor which I loved because it made everything seem like it was floating even more. This painting is called Tongue Lashing. It's from 1989. Uh, it's a painting that's about testing the senses. There is a head trying to get out. And I chose this painting to show to you because it represents 
a force that I began to recognize, sort of like a horror show. There is something in the basement that wants to get out. Or in this case, there's something on the other side of the painting that's looking at us. This you can see from the side. I made this painting. My mother's family, when they moved to New York from Russia, they were in the upholstery business and I learned from my mother how to upholster things. So I made a framework and then I stitched uh, canvas over top of it. That was an early way before I really knew how to make sculpture that I would make things. Something still trying to get out a little more successfully now. Uh, this is called the Carnival of Values from 1990. The figure is from a Magritte painting a uh, man with a bowler hat. And it's combined with a clock, and you can see the numerals there. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, the years teach us what the days never know. As I look back on the development of my work, I see that there is a move to free the figure from the painting. I didn't know it at the time, but my work moved in that direction consistently over about a dozen years. So that in, oh, this is from the side, you can see the television set, which by the way, this is before a lot of surveillance devices. And yet, even in 1990, I had a feeling that we were moving in this direction. Uh, this is called the Tree of Desire. This is from 1993. The figure has become free. She is both aggressive and tormented, crucified, and yet electrified with passion, a major at beating a drum to become free. She comes from the Greek myth of Daphne, who was pursued by Apollo and appeals to her river godfather to save her. He turns her into a tree. So my Daphne is still pretty mad about that. Uh, she looks sort of ferocious. In some ways, I look back at this. I just displayed this painting recently in a show after not seeing it for at least 20 years. And I just was <laughs> surprised that I had made it because it's so aggressive and so monstrous. Um, this is how it looks from the side. You can see that's a full scale snare drum and the legs are cast from my own legs. The next image was a total surprise to me. As I was putting a, a lecture together many years ago now, I came across this connection, the Rothko that I showed you of the crucifixion and this piece, which is a tree of desire. I certainly did not set out to remake the Rothko. I didn't think about it. I didn't remember it. It was not on my radar. This really makes me understand that my subconscious and I'm sure yours too, is very active in reproducing things that you think you've forgotten about. But when you look at it, these floating eyes, the floating limbs, the stigmata, the legs, which are almost uh, exactly in the same position if you flipped it the other way. It's just kind of remarkably weird. I saw this painting recently. It's now at the Jewish Museum in New York. And it still has the same power that affects me. It's very serene and surreal, but it's much smaller than I had remembered it to be. This is Wood Nymph, and it's from 1999. It's another Daphne figure, um, but it's my version, which I think is a feminist interpretation that conflates a woman's role with nature and nurture in a way that is somber, playful, and maybe just a little bit campy. This, this piece, I shouldn't call it a painting, even though it is, it's an oil painting. Of, it, there's no wood in it at all. It's completely trompe l'oeil made with a whole array of different things. It's now at the Zillman Art Museum in Bangor, Maine, where I'm having a solo exhibition of my sculpture. Here she is from the side. She's a good juggler. She's doing a great job there juggling these pies. And um, it also it was a move that, as I've explained to you, I'm trying to push forward. So the figure is out of the painting, but the 
assemblage is still on the wall. This is the first piece that I did that is freestanding. It's called Bouquet and it's 2001, free at last. A sense of a wonder of looking at nature and reconstructing it, but I make sure that the seams show. This is put together like a kit. Each element is removable. It's all numbered with numbers. I'm not trying to disguise the fact that it is a kit, it's visible to the viewer. But the way that I was able to get free from the wall was by taking the wall with me in a way. I had a photograph of myself. It was, uh, I stood in one spot as if I was making a drawing. I measured an exact point where I needed to put an eye. I made a leaf uh, or a rose that looked at the eye or the top of the forehead. That was right. As soon as you step off of that spot, you have to re reconstruct that image all over again. It's Sisyphean beyond belief. And it amazes me now that that was the way that I figured out how to make sculpture is by reconstructing a two-dimensional image. I made it with thermoplastic. Learning to make anything is a long haul. This is before the internet. And so I had to read, oh gosh, um, the New York Guide to Theatrical Fabrication. That was my Bible. And I visited people who were prop builders and that was a huge advantage as well. So it's made with aqua resin, fiberglass and thermoplastic. This was at a show uh, I had a work in um, that's an installation shot from the Academy, the American Academy of Arts and Letters. So this is 2002, the yellow rose is something I also made. This is called Puppet's Dream from 2003. I have no objection to gilding a lily, as you can see. And in fact, this piece is gilded with metallic leaf and then glazed with oil paint color. So there's many steps that go into each element, as you can sort of see here. Uh, so I'm making these gigantic pieces, some of which would take a full year to make. At the same time, I'm making smaller pieces. This is called Argyle. Uh, talk about being inspired or having a sense of wonder. You can have a sense of wonder about just about anything. And in this case, it was about my sweater, a well-loved vintage Argyle sweater that I then fashioned for this, uh, oh, I guess it's about a four foot high creature called Argyle. This is called Blue. And it's also smaller, obviously, than the gigantic ones. It has a kind of what I would call zany quality, like a Dr. Seuss character, where it's, you know, having a hard time standing in one place. Uh, it's from 2007. And it's kind of like a decorative object that becomes an unruly pet. As I mentioned, I teach at the University at Albany, and I would commute from my Brooklyn studio so I'd be gone for three days, and when I opened the door, these sculptures, small sculptures, seemed very happy to see me. They were ecstatic to have me back. And here's a studio shot, and this is from 2010. So I'd done a lot of these pieces, and I began to see the way that they could interact together. I made enough of them, where each piece feels like it has its own personality, its own animation, its own energy. And it was all of a sudden, I just felt that's it. I'm not gonna make sculpture anymore. I'm done making sculpture. I wanna capture that kind of energy in a new way in painting. I could have made installations and in sculpture. It just simply didn't appeal to me. So I started out on a journey that was very difficult. I knew how to paint, but I didn't know how I had to develop a language in painting that had uh, that captivated some of the energy that I felt I had in my sculpture. For I'm not going to show you all the bad work I did from that two year period. But a couple of these drawings, I think, illustrate the point where I'm really drawing the drawings. Okay, but it's a drawing of a sculpture. It doesn't have a standalone world that I was really striving for. 
one of the main influences in this period and continues to be a captivating uh, influence for me is Charles Birchfield, an American um, painter and uh, kind of a insider, outsider. He made these watercolors uh, from, two, from 1917 that he would then go back into in the 50s or the late 40s and remake. I mean, he, he was just a, sort of an eccentric character. I love this painting beyond what I probably should. I just am fascinated by the fact it's called The Four Seasons. The date of the painting is listed as being uh, 1949, I believe, uh, to 1960. And it reminds me of the way that we feel about um, the world when we're walking around in it. We remember winter, we anticipate spring. So what it led me to be able to do was to start to make some drawings that were free, that I wasn't looking at anything. I wasn't looking at my sculpture. I wasn't looking at a photograph. I had made sculpture for so many years. I understood how a form moves through space well enough so that I could do it in these drawings. Many of these drawings are in the BCA show, I want to add. So these are from, um, oh, around 2010 to 2012. And they're quick drawings, meaning that they probably take no more than three hours. I've done a lot of them. And at a certain point, right about here in 2011, or this is 13, I could figure out how to make paintings from them. So the next image is of a painting. And again, this is in the BCA show. It's called Toughing It Out, because that is what I felt I had been doing. I was toughing it out to try to figure out how I could make something that had its own spirit and invent something that came as a kind of kissing cousin from the sculpture. This is early spring. This is a little earlier, 2011. It's also in the BCA show. And um, even though it's a little indebted to the sculpture, it's beginning to develop a world that I feel like you can enter that has a bit of a magical spirit. In 2011, my husband, Jim Butler, who is a wonderful artist and he teaches at Middlebury College, we decided to buy a house in the country, Shoreham. I wasn't keen on living in the country. I didn't really have strong feelings one way or another, but we bought this house and as you can see, it has this beautiful view of the Green Mountains. I enjoy that. That's not what sold me on the house. What sold me on the house is this window right here. That's the kitchen window. It looks out on this steep slope. And on that steep slope, there was nothing planted. There was just dead grass. So there was a rectangle of brown. And to me, that just cried out like, you can make something here. I never thought about gardening before, uh, but after the first summer, I made this, uh, <laughs> garden. It doesn't look much like a garden. It was mostly lifting rocks and buying topiaries and reading a lot about gardening. And I didn't know what a perennial was. I looked, I thought I've got to buy some books on gardening. Then I looked at my bookshelves. I had the, the books already, but I had only looked at the illustrations. I had never read them. Thus began this passionate period for about three years of gardening, where I was learning the Latin names of perennials, getting up early, keeping all these journals. And I know that I have read that there's some bacteria in soil that when you breathe it, you don't even have to touch it, you can breathe it, it operates like serotonin. And I believe that because I felt like I was in this period of ecstasy while I was gardening. And that got into the work. Uh, this is called The Volunteer, and it's also in the show at BCA. It's from 2013. Living in the country, nature started to become less of a scenic image for me and more of a daily encounter with the small wonders, the smell of grass and the feel of soil, the changing light, all of that got into my work. 
Here's another example. This is in the BCA show. This is called Puddles. I wanted to pause with this just for a moment to, to show you that this area right here, so when you're doing a charcoal drawing, it's very quick, it's erasure, uh, things happen, you don't have full control over that. But when you're translating that into a painting, all of a sudden those things like the erasure right down here below the green flower starts to take on a different role. You have to interpret, I should say, I had to interpret those smudgy lines into some way that I could paint them. And the painting became slow, not quick the way that the drawing is. And I just love that idea that one thing moves from one speed to another. This is called Dream Catcher. It's from 2013. And I think that the elements, the characters, as I think about that are becoming more animated. And the main character of this kind of tree with these uplifted arms, I think of as being like a guard or a sentinel overseeing the other creatures like this quivering little blue flower on the lower right. So they're becoming much more um, theatrical and psychological to me. This painting is also in the show. It's called Field Days. It's from 2014. And as you can see, it has a double screen. Paintings don't frequently have double screens. I don't know why, because our world is full of multiple screens all at the same time. We've become very adjusted to that. But we think about a painting as being a single scene. So I really enjoyed having two worlds kind of come together. Maybe it's the same world at different seasons or at different times, different narrative events are happening, uh, but they coexist in a way that I think we can accept. This is a shot of me working on this painting. You can see, I think, from what's hanging on the wall, I do many, many, many color studies. I really work at color. And that way, if I work out the idea of what color palette I'm working with, I can work in a very free way. But when you look out the window, you can also see that some of those elements from the way that the horizon line gets lighter and grayer as it moves back, I knew that, but I hadn't really lived with it before, but it's getting into this painting in a very clear way. This is called Green Light. And most of the works that I'm now showing are in the BCA show. It covers much of the paintings and drawings that I've done over the past nine years. This is a smaller painting and um, it's called Knotty Pine, like the knot in your shoelace knot. From 2016, it's a small painting. It has a very animated character in it. And I think of the character as being like an angry mother with these little children underneath her that she's too occupied with anger to see. But somebody told me recently that she thought it was very obviously Donald Trump. <laughs> Maybe that makes sense. Another kind of angry character. This is called Lookout Point and it's from 2017. You know, I'm an artist and therefore a witness to our time. I think that's what artists do. We provide a testament to the time that we live in. I think artists have always done that. So this painting reflects what I know already about an aspect of climate change. I don't consider my work to be, uh, I'm not an advocate in any way um, for, um, changing that, but I am a witness to it. And at the same time that it's a testament to climate change, it also seeks to communicate the beauty of a red sky and blue melting snow. And talk about beauty, beauty. living in Vermont and seeing the way that snow falls on the trees is so magical. It's as if there's sculptures everywhere. And this is a painting that is um, called Big Snow from 2017. And it, I am seeking to give kind of the magical quality of vibration that I feel when evening is beginning and you see these different shapes that snow make in the trees. 
I don't think that one can compete with the beauty of nature, but I'm trying. This is called Edge of the Woods. It's actually not in the show. And, um, you know, the characters are becoming more vividly human, I think, even though they don't look like they're composed of anything except abstract shapes and maybe an allusion to natural form. But they're rising out of this hole in the ground, two different gangs, two different tribes. They're looking at each other. I don't have a message. My work is not bound. I'm not trying to communicate a message. But as I look back, I see the difference between these two groups and how they're peacefully coexisting. This is called Spring Thaw. It's a small painting that's in the show. What I am interested in here is the fact that the waterfall becomes like a monster, sort of a, its own character as it's um, communicating the sense of energy of snow melting. Sometimes I make dioramas without necessarily thinking that I know what it's going to be. After all my years of making sculpture, I can easily, like on a weekend, make a little diorama. It's like playing house or something that I put things together. And those things could become a model for a painting as this has. This is called Log Jam. It's from 2018. It's not in the show. Um, but I wanted to communicate a sense of magical celestial uh, enchantment. So certain things like that red flower on the far right is exuding its own pink perfume and the orange flower on the lower left has some quality of a, a kind of orange halo. And you know from being in the country at night when you look up at the night sky your eyes get adjusted and you start to see or feel color and vibration. That's what this painting log jam is about. At the same time, now that I have made a way of making paintings for myself, I started to make, uh, go back to sculpture. So now I'm making sculpture and painting and drawing. I draw a, a, a huge amount more than anything probably. And chlorophyllia is the name of this piece in 2016 for a world without color. I think what I got from making a sculpture after making all those paintings was a sense of how form can be communicated in a kind of cartoon language. Like in a cartoon, you might have a form that looks like it's been blown up and then it's been popped. So this piece, which is sitting on a little, apparently a little tiny table, uh, has all these different elements of expanding and contracting. Another piece that I did, now this is 2018. This is called Daphne's Victory. And it's a companion piece to that earlier piece I showed, which I renamed Puppet's Revenge after working on it and giving it legs. It was a commission by a collector who was a CEO of Nike. And I wanted to make it about Daphne and victory, which is what Nike refers to. And uh, so it was like, I think of it as being extremely female oriented. It's decorative, but it's very aggressive at the same time. Again, all the pieces come off. So I shipped it to Portland, Oregon in a crate with maybe 65 pieces for this one piece. Here I am standing, I'm taking a little pause to tell you something. This is now 2018, when it was discovered that I had a non-malignant brain tumor and I had to have an operation just exactly two years ago. So I had many, many months that I was recuperating in which I wasn't able to work, but I had a lot of time to consider my work and to think about it. And when I got back into my studio, I had a kind of revelation that was very important to me, which is that I started to realize that every time at a certain point in my paintings, basically at the point that I had exhausted all the information from the charcoal drawings, I would hit this brick wall and I'd have to reinvent the process in some new way for myself. 
uh, years previously, I had been in therapy and I, my therapist had said, you know, you talk about the relationship you have to your work. If it was a relationship to a person, what would it be? And I thought to myself, and right away I said, bad boyfriend, that's the relationship. Because it was always very exciting and very dynamic, but at one point or another, I would be abandoned. So after all these months of recuperating from brain surgery, I thought I'm too attached to that struggle. I've outgrown the bad boyfriend. I want a new relationship. I want a good partner. And that's when I began to use things that I already, I didn't have to teach myself. I knew how to use Photoshop. I knew how to layer images in a way that when I erased something, uh, as I did in the upper part of the tree, all of a sudden something that was lurking underneath, this yellow, orange, two-eared creature popped up. I hadn't expected that. It was definitely an accident, but it was a full-blown different kind of accident. And it began to suggest to me that the character of the tree had a kind of interior wishful thinking, that's the name, in which it was carrying things around in its own brain. This is called I Was a Zombie. And uh, the idea came from theater and the love of theater. And so the question I ask is, are these roses actors on a stage? Are they at a nighttime party? Or are they refugees uh, that are running out of the woods? This painting is called Nonetheless, also from 2019. It's pre-pandemic but it anticipates many of the catastrophes that we're living in now with floods and fires. And I think you can see right back here, that's from the little diorama, that's a kind of peaceful oasis. Um, the characters in this red boat, they could be witnesses, they could be rescuers. This is uh, the installation, I really hope in the Burlington area, it's really a fabulously uh, installed show. They have great protocols, so you can visit it safely. It's a beautiful building and you can walk through. So I'll give you a very short walk through. As I described, I make a lot of drawings. They're kind of the building blocks of all my other work. And I, lately when I've been showing, I do these big installations that begin to make yet another drawing out of many other pieces. I love the way that Heather and Colin made the installation, just as I showed you the drawing, how, it's, uh, how it yields to some of the ideas or many of the ideas of the painting. I'm gonna end my lecture by going back to the garden because I think it best illustrates a sense of wonder. As I've described to you, the three years I spent building, the first three years of that garden, I didn't want to do anything else, and I didn't do anything else. I worked for 16 hours a day in this great spirit of opt optimism and even ecstasy. And what it yielded was this garden, which I live with now, and I enjoy it immensely. So when I'm looking out that window that I told you was full of brown weeds, it's like a living painting to me, and I get great pleasure from it. The last painting that I'm going to show to you, also from 2019, is called Breezy. It was before uh, COVID, and yet it seems weird to see it now as a kind of precursor. I don't know, the character on the left that has all these pink globules almost seems to be made out of the COVID virus. And the character to the right, I think of as a self-portrait. She is clasping her hands in this kind of anxious way. She has a tear running down her face, but she has the word hopes in flowers spill, spelled out in her, in her head, in her hair. So that is my lecture. I'm going to stop the screen share now. And I guess we will go back to having a conversation and maybe, I hope, some questions. Yes, we'd love some questions. But uh, first, I want to thank you, Joanne, for that fascinating talk about the evolution of your work 
and just that ongoing dialogue between painting, sculpture, and drawing, which is so dynamic and fascinating to me um, as a curator, but also long ago as someone trying to learn these different disciplines, which are very different, and how you, you keep learning from within this kind of shared world of these media. Um, uh, let's now answer some of our attendees' questions uh, posted in the Q&A. Hopefully we have a few. Uh, not yet. I don't want people to be shy. Oh, good. We have one. Um, would you like, to, uh, thank you for this beautiful talk. I always learn a lot from you, Joanne. And would you like to briefly share your daily ritual? Um, are there memorable responses that you have to your work? Well, my daily ritual is a little commandeered by online teaching right now, which makes me, there's just, I, I had to spend an awful lot of time this summer learning how to teach it. But ordinarily, um, you know, there's this term that at first I didn't like, which is that uh, studio practice. I thought that's kind of pretentious for an artist. You know, bankers have a practice, mathematicians have a practice. Artists have just a day they do whatever they do. But I, I kind of value that because in order to be an artist, you do have to practice. And the main thing that you have to do is show up. And I'm pretty good at showing up uh, in that I, I can get discouraged. But Heather, to get back to something you said about how I learned how to do all these things, I taught myself. I read about it. Uh, I tried it. I, I came from a family. My father was an engineer. My mother was an artist. We just tried everything and you could never do it. You had to learn how to do it. So depending on what's going on in my studio, I do a lot of drawings. I'd like to start with that. I'm embarrassed to admit I work on one thing at a time, even though I tell my students that's a bad idea and it probably is a bad idea. But when you're doing painting and sculpture, sculpture makes the studio very, very dirty. And it's hard to have a clean space to make a painting. So right now, I didn't show, you might have noticed any work from this year. I'm cogitating on making things. I've had a lot of shows. I had a show that was in Albany of 27 years of survey. It takes a lot of time to have a show. I feel like I'm complaining about success, but it has kept me out of the studio. And I have this other show now in Maine. And of course I have this beautiful show at the BCA. So I'm beginning just to get back into the studio, working from drawings that I have done, putting them together, see how the characters like each other, how they interact, making a lot of drawings. And then I plan, I have the stretcher bars all ready to go. So that'll be the next thing. Oh, that's great. And I, I can understand how it, you need to focus on one thing at a time, especially during these times, which leads me to another question from Annabelle Hill. And she says, thank you so much for taking time to give this talk. And how has your work been evolving during the past year of major change and disruption? And really that kind of leads into another question, you know, to add to that and expand is even since March, like how is it been evolving, but how are you seeing it differently, even work from a yeah. decade ago? Well, it is different. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to write a little piece for Hyperallergic. I was asked, it's a series that Stephen Main has um, spearheaded for artists to view their own collections, not their work, the work that we all have up on our wall. And I'm going to write about this Carl Wersom piece, which Carl Wersom is one of the Chicago Harry Who. I love his work. I love Carl's work, yes. I love it too. <laughs> and this piece, which I, in another context, I would show you, you know, it starts out looking like just a zany uh, guy at the bar wearing Superman costume. Now, it, to me, it looks exactly like Donald Trump. He's drinking this blue liquid. It could be a vaccine. And so, as I said, when I'm talking about my pieces from 2019, they start to take on a different reading. And now that I'm beginning to work, I'm very keen to I don't know how else to say it, to put myself into the paintings in a more uh, vivid way. So I've been doing a lot of drawings. They're not exactly self-portraits, they're combinations. But uh, the painting that I'm working on is a woman <laughs> holding a log like she's holding a baby. And she has her mouth open as if she's singing. 
and all these trees around her are kind of alive with birds and flowers. And I'm, I intend to call it uh, singing harmony. But I can tell you for sure that painting could turn into something very dark and very different. So this is just at this moment. So I guess that's the thing. I want to put my own voice more directly, uh, more directly to be seen in the work. That's one thing that has changed. And when you say your own voice, if I can follow up, will you be including text again, like that last most recent image where you can see the word hopes in it? Yeah. I mean, is that, yeah. is that just kind of an unusual thing or is that something you're playing with more? I haven't yet decided. The, those flowers that spell out hopes came from a sculpture that I made. I embroidered those letters and it came from a little figure. I didn't show it. And she's holding up all these flowers that are embroidered with letters. In the last show I had, she was on a table that spun around very slowly so you could read it. And what was spelled out was high hopes, false promises. And that seems like a message for today too. So I, she has in this rendition that I'm working on, she has her mouth open. Maybe she's singing, maybe she's yelling. I haven't, I don't know, things change a lot as I work. So maybe, I love the idea of text in paintings. I well, we'll have that. to stay connected and yeah. learn more. And I, I wanna be mindful of time. Uh, we, we still have a few minutes to answer questions. So I'm gonna move on to the next one. Uh, from Jane Ward, and she says, I find it interesting that you spent years making flower sculptures and paintings, and yet didn't know about the plants, but maybe you can expand on that. Um, great job creating a beautiful garden, and does it attract butterflies and bees? Oh, you bet it does. No, I've, I've planted things as pollinating uh, plants, and things that deer don't like to eat. That's been my guiding. Uh, I don't, I, you know, my work, my, my, this sounds like bragging, but I, no one could be more surprised to me than me that I ended up in a gardening magazine. And I've been asked questions like, well, I see that you put grasses, ornamental grasses and topiaries together. So that's, that's such an unusual thing to do. And I think, well, is it? I, I didn't know that. I don't know the rules of gardening. I'm interested in making sculptural uh, topiaries and in that way, I think it carries forward both directions from my paintings and my sculptures back. I've forgotten the beginning of that question. <laughs> it had to do with, oh, why flowers? You know, I, I, Heather, you're on mute. I am. Um, it's the beauty of Zoom and someone opening a door outside. Uh, the question was that you didn't, being surprised you don't know anything about plants. Yeah. And I think that's in terms of gardening, but didn't you mention that you had been drawing and studying them for so long? So it's sort of like yeah. from the observation to the nurturer, is that correct? Oh, even as an undergraduate, I spent, I don't know what, six weeks on this big copper plate. It looks like it, the, the painting, not the painting, but the copper plate looks like something I could have done today. It was a Jimson weed seed pod, very elaborately, very female looking. Uh, and I was told by my professors not to do that. That was a bad idea to spend so much time and for it to be so, I don't know, weird. So uh, I don't know how to describe why things happen. I think that we're driven by something that we, that's like a tuning fork. It's a key that we're hearing in our head. I can't explain it except that it's a sensibility. That's wonderful. And uh, I have a question from Leigh Barbier. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, thank you, the work is gorgeous. And my question is, can you describe again that relationship to painting compared to a bad boyfriend relationship? You know, like, <laughs> and how did this new relationship change your paintings but is it just your paintings or your sculpture is it just like this aha moment yeah i think some it of was, us have this relationship <laughs> right well when i retire in a year i'm going to open up a practice i'm going to help people see what their relationship is to things because for me it was such an epiphany um i felt you know when you step out of doing something every day i i, I was you know 
recuperating for five months before I could even get back in the studio. And I just could anticipate the moment that I was going to get stuck because it was just, it's very predictable. I'll just try to be brief about it. I showed you the charcoal drawings. I paint what's in the charcoal drawing. That's all I've got. Once I've done that and the painting's not finished, I have to reinvent the painting. And that was, I felt that I was too attached to that struggle. I was letting that commandeer me. And so what I, what I just could see very clearly is just don't be attached to the struggle. I know how to use Photoshop. Okay, so here's an example. I get to the point where no more information from the charcoal drawing. I photograph the painting. I put it in Photoshop. I've done a million drawings. I can put something else. I, something else enters the scene. I print that out. I work on that for a while. This might be 50 renditions. It's not just one or two, it's like 50. So I keep adjusting. And then because it's slowed down so much, but it's also much more specific, this more theatrical narrative is allowed to get expressed. That's been very, very fulfilling for me. Um, so that it's, I don't know what to call it, except a more specific kind of storytelling that I'm enabled to do. You're really refining sort of this like visual narrative, so to speak. And, and it seems when you walk in and maybe you see a drawing or a painting, it, it maybe at first glance seems more simple and in its elegance, uh, but yet it's not. And I think that's a fascinating re revelation of the process. Uh, we have time for just one or two more uh, questions. Um, Diane Le Levesque uh, says that she's exciting to, or ex it's exciting to see how you move from the illusion of two-dimensional space to three-dimensional space. And your garden seems to be that space where you're able to literally carve the earth itself into one of your visions. And maybe you could talk a little bit more about that relationship, Joanne. Um, and then the second part of her question is, is how do you experience your daily life in terms of illusionary space, like in your mind's eye as paintings and then the actual space as you are working in your studio or looking out in the world? Because we've had great conversations about that. It's true. And I'm not... Um modest, I guess, in my ambitions. I have big ambitions. I know I'll never complete them, but I take a four mile walk every day in the country and I'm walking through some of these wooded areas. And I think to myself, I want to make this world. I don't want to make a picture of it. I want to make the world the way that it feels. And I've asked other artists, like, do you feel this way? And they'll go, no, I don't feel that way. So I think that it's partly a sense of capturing exuberance that I see, that I feel, that you will always fail at. I accept failure because it's too big of an ambition. So the garden is now, um, it's, it's not I don't feel as passionately about it anymore because it's more finished. And for years, people would like, you know, contractors would come over and say, you know, you own 12 acres. How come you're only working in this one area that as soon as I finish, I would run back in the kitchen and look at it through the window. But now it's become bigger than that. It's more kind of park-like. And um, it shares with my other work a kind of evoking a world. That's the best I can say about it. It's a world you don't like everything about it. I don't like the weeds. I don't like the amount of work. But you have weeds in paintings, too, that you want to get rid of. So it's not that different, really. And, and I'm curious, uh, is this your only garden, or do you have one in Brooklyn that was posed by another person? <laughs> no, I don't have any outdoor space in Brooklyn at all. Mm -hmm. I have a skylight that's annoying because it it's great, but it also throws uh, shadows. No, the thing about being in Vermont, and even Jim and I lived in Middlebury. We lived in Vermont for many years before we, we bought this house. We lived in an apartment. So I actually have never had any outdoor space before this. I didn't want a garden. I didn't think that I was a person who would enjoy being in the country. I didn't know myself. And so this is the very first time that I've really had this experience. So I don't know what to say about it. If I ever leave here, I know I'll start another garden. I'm sure I feel that way. 
And we have time for uh, one final question uh, from Renee Bouchard, and she's very curious uh, how you arrive at your titles. Oh, well, that's a great question. And frequently, I can't remember my titles. Like, they make sense. For I'll give you an example. One of the paintings that had the boat with the people who look like them, not people, the characters who look like them might rescue the tree that was on fire in that flood. Uh, and that was called Nonetheless. That's not a title that would make sense to anybody, but it had resonance with me. I read a story in The New Yorker about a writer who said that his father had dementia, his father was dying. And uh, he went to bed one night and he got up and he said to his wife, I just had a dream. I, I, I saw Uncle Joe last night. And she said, Uncle Joe's been dead for 38 years. And he said, nonetheless. And I just thought that so captures what is impossible. To this writer, he said, it made him believe in the afterlife. And mm. as an artist, it made me believe in doing something which is impossible, counterintuitive, improbable, but nonetheless, there it is. So the titles come from different events that happened for me. I love that personal insight and significance. And great questions, everyone. Thank you so much. And with that, uh, I'm going to sort of end our presentation Q&A portion and just want to finish with a few thank yous first. Thank you, Joanne. You've been amazing today. It's been so insightful learning about your work. And even as a curator, every time we speak, I learn something new, despite all of our conversations and visits, which as probably most of you might surmise, have been uh, basically digital uh, in these last six months, uh, at least. Uh, but I also like to thank um, the man behind the curtain, so to speak, Colin Storrs. Uh, he's been running our presentation. He's our curatorial assistant and resident Zoom webinar expert, as well as our BCA communications team, John and Ted, for really helping us promote and support today's program. Exhibitions such as Joanne's A Sense of Wonder uh, would not be possible without the financial and in-kind support of our funders. And so a special thanks to Mescoma Bank, the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, the NEA, and the Vermont Arts Council. And those of you who haven't had a chance to visit the BCA Center and would like to safely see the show in person, as Joanne said, please come visit us. It's up through October 10th, and you can also, if you're not feeling quite comfortable, you can visit it virtually and get a 3D version of the show on our BCA Home Studio page. And most importantly, if you need some additional joy in your life and your Zoom background uh, requires a refreshing, as you can see, does mine, uh, please note that all of Joanne's work in a sense of wonder is available for purchase through the BCA. And if you want to further explore what's available, Joanne has additional work online at joannecarsonbigcartel.com. Thank you, Joanne, again for joining us today. And thank, thank you, you, everyone. We hope it's to see been a you pleasure. soon. Thank you thank so you. much. Bye. Bye bye.